Welcome once again to University United Methodist Church in East Lansing, Michigan. My name is Bill and I am the pastor here. We are an inclusive congregation and we welcome everyone in this church and we are glad to have you with us again this morning. You are invited to join with me for a virtual fellowship time on Zoom after the service this morning. Uh, I will copy and paste a link into the comment section on both Facebook and YouTube. If you would like to um, receive that invitation via email, just email me at bbills at E-L-U-U-M-C dot O-R-G. We are also beginning to receive offerings for our staff Christmas gift. If you would like to make an offering for our church staff, our lay staff, please um, do that using the Venmo app or by sending your contribution to the lay staff gift here to the church via the U.S. mail. Tom Birchman will now lead us in the call to worship. Let us now read responsively the call to worship. Saints and sinners, sheep and goats are welcome here. Come rejoice in Christ Jesus who welcomes us all. Come share in his grace that we all might be his sheep who feed one another, who act with compassion and love, who offer comfort and mercy, who give as we have received. Come rejoice in Christ Jesus who welcomes us all. Let us pray together. God of glory, we do not always see your glory in the world around us. When we see a person in need, it is not easy to look him in the eye. When we hear a cry for help, it is not easy to offer her quick assurance. When we hear and know of a lonely prisoner, it is not easy to make that an unannounced visit. Forgive us when we fail to see you in our everyday lives. Forgive us when we are afraid to act 
afraid to care. Encourage us, God of glory. Help us to see others with the eyes of compassion that we might be your loving presence in the world. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? 
And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Transition times are awkward times. We may well know what we're leaving behind in a transition, and we may have some hopes and assumptions or ideas about what lies ahead. But as we move through the transition time, anxiety and uncertainty about the future may loom large. You may not have noticed but we are at the end of the year. Not the end of the 2020 calendar year, something that most of us will probably welcome, but we are at the end of the church calendar year. The church calendar runs on a three-year cycle and it's based on the life of Jesus. The three years follow the gospels according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we sprinkle John in throughout the three years uh, because John doesn't really follow the same timeline as the other three gospels. And for deeply profound theological reasons which exceed my very limited knowledge, the church in its wisdom has decided to call these, this three year cycle year A, year B, and year C. Today we close the book on liturgical year A, and next week with the first Sunday of Advent, we will begin year B in preparation for the coming of the Christ child with the first Sunday of Advent. Now many people observe the last Sunday of the church year as Thanksgiving Sunday, and sometimes I even do this myself, but in fact, Thanksgiving falls on Thursday on the church calendar. The final Sunday of the church year is actually something called Christ the King Sunday, or in some traditions it's referred to as the Reign of Christ Sunday. Christ the King observes the completion of the life cycle of Jesus by recognizing his eternal glory and his place as ruler and final judge of all the world. Modern Western democracy has caused Christ the King Sunday to fall out of favor, as few of us in this part of the world understand or care about life lived under the subjection of a ruling monarch. Originally, I had planned to treat Thanksgiving today but recent events in our nation have caused me to consider themes such as transition, political rule and leadership ethics, and even Christian accountability. The transition this year from Christ the King Sunday to the first Sunday of Advent next week places two gospel passages, one after the other on the Christian calendar in a way that highlights transition as well. The Christian New Year begins four weeks before Christmas. 
Next week, we begin preparation for Christmas with the first Sunday of Advent. And that first Sunday of Advent always begins with each gospel writer's prediction of the second coming of Christ. The idea is that the first coming of Christ at Christmas carries with it the implied hope of early Christians for his second coming. The current year, based on Matthew, ends today also with a story of the second coming of Christ. It is used for Christ the King Sunday because Matthew's story describes Jesus as the righteous shepherd king surrounded by angels and sitting on his throne in glory, rendering judgment upon the nations. So Matthew's Christian year ends with the second coming of Christ, and then next week Mark's Christian year will begin also with the second coming of Christ. Some of you have heard me say that I have doubts about a literal return of Jesus. The early church certainly hoped that he would return to institute God's rule in their lifetime, a rule of peace, justice, and prosperity for all. Within our New Testament, we can see the church beginning to deal with the delay of that hoped for second coming. And for example, most of us know that there's a verse in there somewhere that says, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. That, by the way, is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And that is evidence of the early church leadership trying to explain the delayed return of Jesus. We also know various ver verses indicating things such as the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So one must always be ready for judgment regardless of the length of any delay. And of course, much ink has been spilled over the second coming of Christ. It has been the topic of very mediocre and theologically flawed novels and films. Books have even been written about the so-called history of the end of the world and the failure of Christians at trying to predict the second coming. Jesus may return someday, but every biblical literalist really knows what the word soon meant in the first century and what the word soon means today. So what is this all about? And why would it need to come up on back-to-back -back Sundays at the end of one church year and then the beginning of the next new church year? The answer to that question, I think, is really quite simple, even if the matter of the return of Christ is not simple. At the heart of the Christian longing for the return of Jesus is the human longing for peace, justice, and prosperity for all people. In the first century, these things eluded most people. And still in our current century, these things elude too many people. In a few weeks, we will be singing, Hail the newborn Prince of Peace. In a world and in a nation, where peace and justice and prosperity are limited to a privileged minority, while the least of these brothers and sisters of Jesus become more and more marginalized and their suffering increases. Historically, Christians have longed for the return of the righteous judge who would correct the injustices and abuses which human rulers have failed to correct or even deliberately inflicted on the poor, the hungry, the sick, the foreigner, children, women, and people of color. 
if the church were more successful at building the kingdom of God on earth, then perhaps people would not have such a longing for regime change in the form of the second coming of Jesus. Matthew's story today about the righteous shepherd king returning in apocalyptic glory to act as judge in the same way that a shepherd might separate sheep from goats is nothing less than a cry for justice as much as it is the hope for the return of Christ. For in the story, the righteous shepherd king who separates the sheep from the goats is not necessarily somebody who is mean or vengeful or out simply to punish people. The righteous judge can be seen certainly as the good shepherd, caring for the sheep simply by enforcing accountability for the sake of justice and seeing to it that the will of God is done on earth as it is in heaven. This apocalyptic son of man actually judges and condemns nobody. Instead, in truth, we each render our own judgment upon ourselves with our own personal responses or our lack of response to the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whenever we face suffering, whenever we face injustice, whenever we face hunger or oppression, we face personal choice. And we may respond as Jesus calls us to respond, or we may simply choose to ignore the needs of others, thus allowing or even increasing the suffering of innocent others. And our choice is our judgment upon ourselves. And Christ the King simply reminds us of our choices when everything else in our life is said and done. 2020 has been a long and difficult year. Somebody recently remarked that if 2020 were a scented candle, the fragrance might be called burning outhouse. Months ago, when I was asked about having church on Easter, I said that if we miss Easter, when we do come back to church, we'll celebrate Easter the first day we're back. And now Christmas Eve is in question. And hospitals are full. The economy is wobbling. Jobs and businesses are in jeopardy. COVID is spiking and talk of shutdown looms once again. And brothers and sisters, family members, co-workers, friends, parents, children, each of us are afraid that the other is trying to subvert our shared democracy at the expense of the other. Things like protest, ridicule, argument, name-calling, insults, and the belittling of others have become the order of the day in our society. And in the midst of this, people are sick, people are hungry, people are suffering, and people are just tired of it all. Is it any wonder that for centuries people would hope for the return of Jesus to set things right? In Matthew's story, when the apocalyptic Son of Man separates the sheep from the goats, there's a real sense of surprise on the part of everyone. And it's 
almost as though in the end, nobody really expected to be held accountable for their choices, their words, or their actions. But in the Christian tradition, we assume that God's justice requires human accountability. Some will be surprised because their treating of the least of these brothers and sisters of Jesus in their time of genuine need, their treating of other people with a Christ-like manner was simply second nature. And so they will be surprised for being judged so favorably. Others will be surprised, equally so, for failing to act with love and compassion and mercy. Some who call themselves after the name of Christ will be surprised for failing to act in a Christ-like manner in the times when that was most needed. And so God's judgment is never arbitrary toward anyone. We each own that judgment by the choices we make, the things that we say and the things that we do and the things that we fail to do or say every day. You see, we can choose in favor of the least of these, the brothers and sisters of Jesus in their need, or we can choose to ignore those real needs of those real people as we simply pursue our own self-interest. And for those choices, each one should expect to be held accountable. So we end another Christian year today reminded of how it was that ancient Christians in the days of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John longed for peace, longed for justice, how it was that they longed for God's mercy. And we're reminded of that ancient Christian longing for the reign of Christ over all people, a reign where hunger, sickness, poverty, injustice, and suffering are met with Christ-like compassion and healing by brothers and sisters. And until that longing for fairness, peace, healing, and genuine prosperity is realized for all, let each one of us resolve to do more next year than we have done this year to make the world that we are living in a better place, a more Christ-like place. Jesus came to us as the bringer, the proclaimer of good news. He came preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. And what does God want from any of us but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? The kingdom of God is at hand. It has been at hand. It came at the first coming of Jesus some 2,000 years ago. Yet we find ourselves still in that in-between place, still in that time of tradition, still in a time of already, but not yet. The kingdom of God has, become, has begun, but it has not yet been fulfilled. And its fulfillment with God's help is in our hands. So let us together resolve to be thankful for the ministry that we have been given. Let us together resolve to work together 
to make things better and to make life better and easier for all of God's people, especially those who have been pushed aside by the present rulers of this world. Amen. As we move now to a time of prayer, I would like to remind you that you can submit a prayer concern to the church office through the mail, the telephone, or our Facebook page. Today we lift up in our prayers Kelly Wheaton, Becky Gouge, and William Depew, who are all ill with COVID-19. We offer our condolences to friends and family of Chris Cook, who died on November 10th while in hospice care. We also commend to you for prayers John Stahl as he continues in his battle with ALS. Claudette Parity, David Blakesley, Tony Vincent, Brad Kesey, Don Harrington and William Scholes are all ill with cancer. Please pray as well for Howard Moore, his son Paul and grandson Mark, and Irma Parks. All who serve in our armed forces, especially Sean Elowski. And please continue to pray for our missionaries at Africa University in Zimbabwe. Jane and Larry Keyes, our Bishop David Bard, our Superintendent Jerry Devine, and of course, Reverend Jim McGee, and our MSU Wesley Foundation Campus Ministry. Please bow with me in prayer. Almighty and merciful God, during this very unusual, unprecedented and challenging time 
We pray for your grace. We pray for your wisdom. We pray also, O oh God, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit that we might be encouraged and filled with renewed spirits of hope, perseverance, and encouragement as we move into this time of transition for our nation, as we move into this time of holiday, this time that is both troubling and made challenging by COVID-19 and its impact on so many, many people. Grant us courage for the facing of these days. Grant that we might see in our midst signs of your presence. Grant that we might see in our midst signs of hope. And grant that we might see in the needs of our brothers and sisters opportunities for ministry, for encouragement, for the bearing of one another's burdens and the lifting of one another's spirits. Grant, O oh God, that we might persevere as we help one another and as we follow Christ throughout these days and throughout all of our days. God, we pray for our nation. We pray for some sense of reconciliation. We pray for a renewed spirit of unity. We pray for the hope of setting aside difference and working for a common good. We trust our nation and we trust our leaders and we trust ourselves to your guidance, to your care, and to your wisdom. We pray for all of those whom we have lifted up to you this day. We pray for those who grieve. We pray especially for those who are ill. We pray for those who know that their lives are drawing to a close and we commend them to your love and to your care. We especially pray for the growing number of families, friends, loved ones, and strangers whose lives have been affected by the COVID pandemic. We ask that you would help us do all that we can to play a part in stopping the spread and promoting wholeness and healing and health. We thank you for so many who work day by day to minister to the sick, to minister to the dying, to suffer with the suffering, and to bring hope and new life to others in their healing. Grant these people strength and encourage them in their work and help them to feel the presence of our prayers that we might lift and strengthen them. We trust, O oh God, that you know all of our needs. We trust our lives and those dear to us, to your love and to your care. We take heart in your promise to hear our prayers, to never leave nor forsake us. 
And so we bring all of these concerns, all of these celebrations, all of our joys, all of our sorrows to you as a matter of faith. And we offer them and ourselves, our loved ones, our church, our nation and this world. We lift them all to you in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray to you together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He's given Jesus Christ, his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say, He's given Jesus Christ, his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. And now may the peace of Christ, that peace which surpasses all human understanding, may his peace be your peace this day and every day of your life. Amen. <laughs>